Hi everyone, welcome back to this uh, channel. Today uh, at this uh, Neurons Place we are going to go through a study that has recently been published in the Frontiers in Neuroscience and uh, it's all about how we can think about uh, emotional arousal and uh, how we respond to advertising and whether those types of responses are predictive of ad success basically. So in this study, the question is all about uh, do emotions lead to ad success? And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about here is this, uh, you know, first of all, we're going to have a little talk about what that means in general. So what is uh, emotions? How do we measure emotions? What have uh, previous studies shown? And so forth. If we look at the earlier studies, we can definitely see that uh, there have been a long thread of articles that have looked at the relationship between emotional responses and ad effects. For example, we see there's a link between emotional responses to ads and ad attitudes, to brand attitudes, to things such as purchase intent, and then of course also viewing time. So there's already studies that have been demonstrating that uh, there's a relationship between ad responses and emotional ad responses and ad effects. So that's good. And this is something where we see that neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience can bring something to the table, is when we can measure emotional responses as they unfold over time. So imagine when you watch a, an ad in a cinema or a television or a social media on your phone or your PC, for example, you do have different responses. Traditional methods, they rely on, on people basically asking you questions uh, about how do you feel about the ad, how emotional was it, uh, and what do you think about it, and so forth. The problem with that is that we can't just ask people all the time how they feel, because you imagine that you sit in this environment, and then all of a sudden you have people poking into you asking, how do you feel now? How do you feel now? And how about now? And oh, by the way, right now, how does that feel? Obviously, you know, your experience of that uh, cinema or that ad in general will just be ruined because you will be starting to introspect, it will disturb you and so forth. So this is where we can see that biometric and neurometric measures can come in and they can add value by measuring emotional responses as they unfold over time. So that's at least one um, good thing about neuromarketing per se. When we look into the brain, we know that there are certain structures of the brain that are more related to emotional responses than others. And if you look at this figure here, we can see that the amygdala is a structure that we know is involved in emotional responses, and especially to emotional arousal, which is the intensity of emotional responses. And this red little dot here, we have one in each of our uh, brain hemispheres. So this uh, part of the brain is involved in a network that is responsible for emotional responses. And as we know, emotional responses is a whole cascade of things, as opposed to feelings in which I can have a conscious experience of being, you know, something that is pleasant or unpleasant. Emotional arousal and emotional responses are typically what we call direct and subconscious or unconscious responses that manifest as things such as changes in behavior, changes in your pupil dilation, changes in heart and respiration and so forth. So heart rate and respiration. So imagine that right now you are hopefully in a parasympathetic state, which means that your brain is in a relaxed state. It, you know, your pupils are constricted. The, the heart rate is slow. Uh, respiration is also relaxed. You have a digestional system that works very well. It's just relaxed and, you know, it's working and doing this thing. But then imagine that something all of a sudden happened outside your door. It was a large explosion, for example. How would you respond? Yeah, exactly. There's a switch down then to the sympathetic brain response. And the brain then leads, uh, kind of triggers a response in the nervous system that leads to changes throughout the body. We see that the pupils are dilating. We see that the heart rate and the respiration goes up. We see that the digestional system stops. And all this is preparing you as an organism to survive. Because you, know, you can imagine that when you take in, you know, pupil dilation goes out, it basically means that more information can come in through your eyes. And it also means that heart rate and respiration ensures that you as a body have more uh, nutrients and oxygen to your muscles so you can act. And this is, uh, you know, even small changes in arousal levels and emotional responses can lead to small changes in, you know, this switch between parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. 
And what this means is that we can we can have this claim that a small spike in emotions can actually have a large impact on ad effectiveness. And it's not because we need kind of horror movie ads to have an impact or you know, highly erotic ads to have an impact. Even small subtle changes in emotional uh, resonance in an ad can lead to a substantial impact on how the ad affects customers and viewers. In this study uh, I'm going to talk about today is a very recently published study by uh, from Eilish Smith's lab uh, by Eilish uh, Boxham and Smiths. Um, as you probably know, Eilish Smith is one of the persons that you know. I think he is actually the guy who uh, called and termed and, and coined uh, neuromarketing as it is. You know, the combination of neuroscience and, and marketing to better understand marketing effects. Uh, so he is the guy behind the name neuromarketing. Um, in this study that was published in the Frontier Special Issue on uh, Consumer Neuroscience and Neuromarketing that I'm a co-editor of, uh, this is one of the articles I, I really enjoyed uh, you know, following through the review process because it's, it's a great piece of, of work. And I'm going to present this today. Before we jump into to that, uh, one of the things I need to talk about first is what we call functional localizer. And functional localizers is, is actually a term from the neuroimaging um, work. So if you're doing fMRI studies in particular, you know that functional localizer is something that you can use in order to find a particular part of the brain that you're interested in, you know, if you think that it has a particular function. On this slide, uh, if imagine that you have an idea that there's a certain part of the brain that is involved in processing faces. So, um, and, and what you want to do then is to first of all test, you know, you show people some faces, you show them some cars maybe, some houses, some, you know, some other things. And then you only look at the activity, you try to look at the activity that is only present when people are watching faces as opposed to non-face stimuli. And then what pops up in your analysis is most likely areas that might be involved in uh, processing of facial attributes. In this case, this is uh, an example from, from a study showing uh, the fusiform face area, and this is something where that we can all find in our own brain. Um, the thing is that there's a variability in who, where this structure is, where this you know fusiform face area in, is in each of our, our brains. So it means that you have to do this at the individual level. Um, imagine also if you want to undergo surgery and you want to find out the area that is involved in the particular function uh, because you don't want to hit that. Let's say it's a language area, for example. Then very often as a pre-surgical uh, intervention, you do a functional MRI to identify regions that are involved in certain functions. And then if you want to you know, surgically remove a part of the brain, at least you can see if you can minimize the damage. Uh, so you can hopefully minimize functional um, you know, dysfunctions, so to speak, to cognitive or emotional parts. In this type of work, then you can see that this part of the brain on the left side is what we call the fusiform face area. It's under, underneath, uh, kind of the, the underbelly of the, the temporal lobe uh, of the brain. And then if you plot the response pattern over time, you can definitely you know, see how that responds uh, over time to faces and to cars, so Im images of faces and images of cars in this um, perspective. So you can definitely see that there's a difference in this region. It seems to be more selectively responding to faces relative to cars. And although this study was an EEG study, it's using the same principle because what the authors wanted to do first was to see if they could identify areas or response patterns in the EEG in the individual level that was responsible for arousal responses. So the first task people went through was to do a kind of a standard picture set that we know already now that they are, you know, that these are triggering emotional responses, positive and negative emotional responses, then also high and low arousal responses. So what the authors did was then to look at the, the change in frequencies and electrodes. Uh, so are there any particular combination of electrodes that we have on the scalp and the frequency bands that we can measure that seems to track arousal the most. So this is what they, they were able to do. They were able to narrow down the scope to a certain level of frequencies around the alpha band and for certain types of electrode constellations, as you can see here in the graph as well. So that became their functional localizer, if you like, or we can even say that this was an arousal metric that they came up with. And then they went on from there to the actual study of measuring how this metric performed uh, when people were exposed to different ads. 
So as they perform different ad responses, they can also track you know, how high or low the arousal response was. And in this case, they also re related this to you know, some questionnaires and some tests afterwards that are standard metrics of ad success or ad metrics, if you like. One of the metrics was um, whether the ad was noticeable uh, you know, was the ad noted? Was it remembered? And so forth. And the second type of ad was whether people had a changed attitude or a positive attitude towards the ad. And what the researchers found was a, ch a kind of an opposite effect here. They saw that the higher the arousal was, the more noticeable the ad was. But on the other side, they also found that the higher arousal was, the less attitudes, the lower the attitude toward the ad was. So there was kind of an opposite effect here. And as they say themselves, although advertisements that evoke more arousal will likely be more noted, they are not necessarily perceived positively. And it's even I can even extend that and say, you know, ads that are more noted are probably less liked. And that's an interesting little twist to, you know, our findings here. Should, it on, should we only focus on emotional responses when we do advertising, for example? There might be a breaking point that two emotional ads might actually be a bad thing. So this study is a great example of how you can use EEG or biometrics or neurometric measures to develop a, an arousal score and then use that score to predict something about you know, the outcome of an ad. Now, one of the things that we can see is that this is only focused on arousal. And as you might probably know, arousal is one of two different dimensions of ad, uh, emotional responses. So on one dimension, we have arousal going from low to high. But you can have a high arousal when you watch a horror movie or when you watch uh, an erotic ad, for example. So high arousal in itself does not necessarily tell you whether it's positive or negative. And that's why uh, additional studies can also look into the valence of emotional responses, whether something is positive, neutral, or negative. So that's the way to kind of have two different dimensions. And in neurons, we have uh, two different dimensions. We are watching you know, both arousal, the intensity of the emotion, and we're also tracking the motivation, as we call it. So that's the, you know, whether people are showing an approach response or avoidance response or a neutral response. So the combination of the two are actually the most important ones. So this study de definitely demonstrates that it's possible to use the EEG and to develop a, an arousal measure from scratch using the func functional localizer approach and then to use that and deploy that as a reliable measure or as a good measure of ad responses that eventually leads to you know, a predictability of you know, certain outcomes of ads. If you're interested in looking more into emotional responses and really get, get it right from the first time, I highly recommend this book, uh, How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett. I'm a huge fan of Barrett's work. Uh, she's the current and sitting president of the Association for Psychological Science in the US. And uh, she's done a great amount of work looking into all different facets of emotional responses and feelings and emotions. So I highly recommend this book if you haven't already uh, bought it. Right, so there you have it. This is the study by Arlo Schmitz and his, from his lab looking into emotional responses and ad effects. And, uh, you know, there's definitely going to be more uh, studies that I will present here on this channel, so just stay tuned.